Hello, this is Graphic Policy Radio at the intersection of comics and social movements. This is your host, Elon Levin, and this is a comics podcast. This is a comics podcast for the kind of people who are looking for the press statement from Dr. Doom on the death of his colleague, supervillain Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Seriously, they had a team up in supervillain team up number seven, 1976 by Steve Englehart and Herb Trimpey. Uh, like, this actually happened. This is a team up. And a lot of people were like, I, they were not sure which press statements were going to come how and like who would be saying what, because a lot of people are pretty cowardly. But I, I was looking for that Dr. Doom statement and it has not been delivered still. But joining me today is the author of my very favorite Kissinger obit, the man whose headline was, quote, Henry Kissinger, war criminal beloved by America's ruling class finally dies. And that man is Spencer Ackerman. He's back with us to talk about the finale of his wonderful miniseries with Evan Narciss and artist Jesus Marino and color artist Michael Atiba. And that is Waller versus Wildstorm. Now all four issues are available. Welcome back to the show, Spencer. Hi. How's it going, Alana? Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to you. I, I was so excited to have this copy in my hands and be able to read it nice and early. And I've been really such a huge fan of the series. I This has been such a big year for people's comics debuts. There have been so many times where, I mean, I, it's true that you have a team working with you who have written comics before, but it's still just like all these people's debuts. And I'm like, holy fuck, you guys keep knocking it out of the ballpark. So, so give yourself a big pat on the back, my friend. This is really excellent stuff. Thank you so much. It means so much that you've supported it so strongly. As I've told you before, you were one of the people who I wanted this most to work for. Aww. And it means a lot that this this worked for you. Thank you. Truly, truly. And it's it's I, I'm excited. Do we know when the, the when the actual like full uh graphic novel is gonna be released? Is that in the spring or um, there will be a hardcover collection that's going to be available in January, at the um, end of January, I think. Mm -hmm. um, go to your local comic store and ask them to pre-order you a copy. If you are listening to this before January 2024 and you go to bulletproofcomicswithanx.com, uh, the mighty Bulletproof Comics uh, store in Flatbush is selling – a signed four issue set of Ooh. Waller versus Wildstorm in time for the holidays. Right, um, right, right. So That's if you would like it. one of those, uh, go to Bulletproof Comics with an X dot com. Oh, I love to hear you supporting our local comic stores. How has it been for you doing comic signings? Your first comic signings? It's incredible. I've been lucky enough now to sign in. All the boroughs of New York except the Bronx. So if anyone huh. listening to this runs a comic store in the Bronx and wants me to sign, I do want to go all city. It's been it's been amazing. I can't tell you like how much it means to me that people take time out of their Wednesdays, let alone their Saturdays, um, mm. and have come to get me to to sign their comics, explain what the comic's about, shoot the breeze a little. It's hmm. it's felt it's 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 been warmth for the soul. I'm curious, what is the youngest person who you've seen come out for this book? My first signing at Bulletproof Comics, there was a ten year old uh, whose father brought him out, took pics with the young gentleman, asked me uh, to sign some some copies for him. Uh, his dad also, in addition to buying the first issue of Waller versus Wildstorm also bought my book, Reign of Terror, mm. How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. And on the one hand, I didn't want to step on the toes of a sail. But on the other hand, I did have to ask his father to make sure that he was aware that this comic was probably not appropriate reading for a 10-year-old, let alone my book. But I'm a little <laughs> less worried about that. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. I love it. And I'm glad people are picking up your book as part of this as well. It's it's I it's it's really cool to see these two things be linked hand in hand because I think that you're going to get an audience for each one that you would not have had otherwise and that the audiences deserve to have both. Thank you. I've been trying when I talk about this book to the people who are are in it for my journalism to try and say that 
the journalism that I do is the same thing that I'm getting after with the comics that I write because mm. the, the themes really do overlap for me as a writer. Uh, it was cathartic to be able to approach these issues out of the context of reporting a true story and into something a little bit more uh, perhaps lyrical, if that's the right word. Maybe it isn't to kind of give a sense of, of sort of where I think all these themes lead. Um, and that was something mm. that, that I tried very hard to do with, with Waller versus Wildstorm. Oh, I like that. Yeah. It actually reminds me of, I've, I've interviewed a number of the writers of Our Flag Means Death. And one of the things that one of the writers, Zare Ferrer, had said to me was that because there were actual IRL pirates of non-binary gender who were pirates in the real world, mm -hmm. they wanted there to be a non-binary pirate character, but they wanted one of them to not be an actual real historical figure because they wanted the freedom to not have to tell this one person's like mm -hmm. actual lived story for this important piece. And I, 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 I've been thinking about like the ways in which that having the ability to do fiction can free you to say some things that you would not really be able to say if you were confined to reportage or like a straight history. Absolutely. And that was to me the real joy of writing this specific story. Well, we are going to be doing a spoiler filled conversation today. I really recommend anybody who has not picked up the comic book to go check out our first, ep the first, uh, interview that Spencer and I did together about this that came out earlier in the year. I believe the first like 40 minutes or something like that of that episode is spoiler free. So you can go and listen to that, then make the obvious correct choice to purchase the comics, read them, and then come back and listen to the rest of this episode. So we have your warning now, get your comics in. And from here on now, we're going to talk about literally anything and everything that is happening in this series. Uh, I, I want to start off by saying, oh my God, that opening sequence was terrifying, which I know is exactly what you were looking for here. Uh, everything. You, you mean an issue? Your, you mean an issue four? Yeah, issue four, four. issue four. Yeah, this is all issue four spoilers now, kids. Like, really, re please, please read the whole comics and then come back. <laughs> issue four, yeah, issue four opening is terrifying with the jungle coming alive, and I had just not thought about the return of we we earlier see the central american people getting like devastated by us troops and it's sort of like part of this bigger picture and then we see how that connects directly back to the story and it kind of slowly reveals itself in a way that like i didn't see it coming and it was just really really sharp thank you fun story about that scene all of that is, no pun intended, an outgrowth of no, no. an idea that my co-writer Evan Narciss had to help give a greater visual element to something in issue one. And like his idea was like, yeah, like what if we had like a kid in here who could like control like plant life? And that kid who we call Ignacio Rivas comes back in in reference in issue two and when i sat down to write issue four the first scene that i knew i knew the opening i knew the first scene was mm -hmm. going to be yumiko as cybernary wins jen mm -hmm. long loses and dies and we're off to yeah. the for the for the conclusion and then i had to solve like the problem of like well how does she win like she's going to have to win with the suit, but that can't be it because she's destroying a guerrilla movement here and uprooting a community. And that idea that Evan had to have a character that controls plant life became like, oh, let's just have the land betray uh, the people who see themselves as the, the custodians of it against the ravages of America and its proxy. And, the more I the the more I like that, the more I was like, oh wow. Like we the 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 opportunity in comics to literalize the metaphor, to literalize the power mm -hmm. um just became irresistible to me. And soon we had um we had that. Another element to it 
the original artist on the Eric Battle was still on board for the book when I was writing that script. And Eric had said early on when I asked him, what's, what do you like to draw and what do you not like to draw? Uh. And he was like, give me monsters. Give me, give me however you can do it. Like, give me like crazy monsters to draw. And by the time uh, it came to draw issue four, really, I guess by the time it came, anyway, by the time it came to issue four, Jesus had, had replaced Eric. Eric had scheduling problems that it turned out couldn't be mitigated. I love Eric as a person and as an artist. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, Jesus Marino is a master craftsman of superhero comics. And I am beyond stoked that I got to work with him, let alone my first time out. And <laughs> definitely the kind of postpartum withdrawal I feel from Waller versus Wildstorm is no longer like knowing that at some point I'm going to have pages from Jesus in, in my email bo- inbox. Aww. I mean, like this is just such classic, let's say Bronze Age Vietnam War comic detail illustration in here like throwback in the best of ways oh yeah nom in his pages Mm -hmm. um especially we have to shout out michael atia because his color work here is the mood and Mm. as you go through it the palette that that michael uses crescendos and like dips down each scene perfectly um And I just, I can't believe that I was this lucky to work with such amazingly talented people who, whose visual sense I I won't ever be able to even comprehend, (laughs) uh, let alone approximate. Definitely was surprised to learn in writing comics, at least among the team that, that I did this one with. My impulse was to try and not be super specific. In the scripting, because I just would would have notes that'd be like, stuff will occur to you while you read the script. Just do what sounds good instead of what I write. And I came to learn that more specificity in the scripting stage than I would have thought was what the artists on this book desired. I I love what he's done with the cybernary costume and the design. Like it could have been. Like, I am very pro-cheesecake when it's appropriate, but cheesecake would not have been appropriate for the tone of this comic or the character who it is on. And And, in this scene, I think, especially, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, like, what's great is, like, it has all the cheesecake-y shit the original design has, but it doesn't feel cheesecake-y. It feels fucking scary and not like somebody's trying to get me to wank off to it. Yeah. That's appropriate because she's fucking terrifying. I mean- what page is this page five where you have the three panels where she's like you just sort of get the sense of how overwhelming her attack is she's everywhere at once and it's just so gorgeous and elegant and scary and i mean her just first descending i mean these are all just making sense of 90s costumes really (laughs) should get should that that should be a special award in the eisner's like the eisner award for you've made this 90s costume make sense um so he should get an award for that yeah i'm all for it that really was a challenge. We we wanted to make sure that no disrespect to the original creators of Cybernary, there was an element of the character, particularly a visual element that was like, probably this these terms would be anachronistic, but like a kind of a real doll meets Terminator. Definitely we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to make it clear that this is a terrifying, intimidating figure unleashing this uh, pure will to power that Yumiko Gamora possesses, but have it still be visually resonant and clear to those who remember slash cherish the original way that cyberna- both cybernaries appeared in the original uh, Wildstorm comics. I just think he d- he did an incredible job. Like the, there are so many different ways you could have designed that, and it looks fantastic. And it does it fits the scene. And what kills me at the end is you see her doing just zapping General Rong's face. It's brutal. She's like melting her face off, 
And Slade Wilson Deathstroke is standing there in his like classic buccaneer costume. The little camera up taking a click photo to document that this happened for the report back for the contract as a contractor. And like, there's something about his tiny little camera. I know. It's so <laughs> petty. Like, it, it's so good to me that it's like this like tiny little like consumer petty camera that I, for some reason that just, I don't know if that was you guys' note or the artists, but like, no. that's exactly right. No, that's, that's absolutely all Jesus. That was the details of that. Like if I could not have written something that grim and that funny, it was just like the magic of him having, I, I will tell you there is not a visual detail in this comic book. I did not obsess over just mm. like, and I don't even mean the stuff that, that I put in there. I mean, like when I got the sure. pages back and I saw the choices that Eric and then Jesus made. And I just love focusing on, on, on like these incredible details at the same time, like how big and absurd and like techie Slade's binoculars look on, on the earlier pages and yeah, where yeah. He's, he's holding up his arm in the his stop motion. Sta- yeah. yeah, just being like, don't, we're not going to do anything yet. You've got these tendrils of seemingly living vegetation hovering over the main target in this scene. And there's Slade being like, nope, this is going to be something that the client takes care of herself. She told mm-hmm. you that in issue two. She wants her photo of her her heroic destruction of the evil radical in the jungle like exactly it's just, it is all state this is all stage directed yes and slade and- gets that like slade is so slade is a super villain who understands that he is a mook but he's like the mook who understands that in in my death stroke and before him captain slade wilson he's he's a special operator that would include psyops that would include mm-hmm. influence operations Slade knows the power of visuals and the power of propaganda. And Mm -hmm. that's an element of the success of the operation. I also wanted him to be documenting it. And we can talk about this a little later when, when perhaps if you want to talk about the on page journalism in the comic. Yeah. But I wanted Slade to be documenting it, contrasting with the way that the narration is Lois Lane's expose in, mm. in the Daily Planet, because in issue three, Slade is the one who, like, has his focus not really so much on Battalion. His focus, as and you can kind of see it, you know, more clearly in retrospect. I think when the whole book is 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 together now that all the issues are out. Issue one, when Slade is up on the roof of the hotel. He's surprised to see Battalion. He was right. there to spy on Lois. He's there to keep an eye on Lois. He's the one in issue three who reminds Adelaide and Amanda that they were up on Waller's communication. That I'm sorry, that they were up on Lois's communications because she's in touch with Wrong, who's Yumiko's enemy. Right. And so in issue three, when Slade realizes that he has killed Battalion, in full view of a Daily Planet reporter, his impulse is to kill the Daily Planet reporter. The Planet reporter, yeah. Like, you've got to tie up this loose end. And then when Amanda, I mean, I was never going to kill Lois Lane, come on. But no. when <laughs> Amanda and Adelaide are telling him, like, Slade, you have to stop, it's Slade who says, that was a big fucking mistake. Have fun learning that lesson. Slade yeah. is the one in this book who respects the power of journalism here. I'm just realizing that like we have talked about issues two and three, but we have not talked about issues two and three for the podcast. That's true. Yes. I was like, oh yeah, we haven't heard a talk well, about that. for issues two and three. Well, obviously, because we're talking about issue four, but like, dude, you killed Battalion. Let I me did. talk to you. Let's talk about how you, let's talk about how you killed Battalion. Wow. Yeah. So what's it like killing American hero icon uh, Battalion? <laughs> okay. So this is a callback in the original Stormwatch series, back before Wildstorm was at DC, when it was at Image. Issue 16 of Stormwatch, which I'm holding in my hands right now, mm-hmm. um, written by Ron Mars, amazing Matt Broom and Trevor Scott art. Um, there's this 
uh, scene on the cover where you've got Battalion facing off with a creature who looks like Maul from Wildcats, but is in fact like a different kind of like doomsday-ish character. And you think, oh, wow, that's a super cool cover. I wonder what this, what's going to happen in this book. And then if you're like me, you don't open the comic to the, to, to the first page. You flip to the back to see what cool stuff might be on the back or even just an ad. And on the back of Stormwatch 16 is an ad for Stormwatch 17, which reads, Battalion Dead, the Team in Chaos, <laughs> Requiem for a Fallen Hero. And this scene is all of Stormwatch on, like, like at Battalion's funeral. And, like, I just, for, forevermore, I loved, like, the the way that they decided it would be a good idea to put on the back cover of issue 16 that like the leader of the team doesn't make it out of that book and spoil <laughs> it on the back cover. God. So we, the mandate for this book was to do a year one for Amanda Waller. And then it expanded to become a Wildstorm 30th anniversary showcase. The mandate was always going to be to be brutal. And to have a formidable character who she could play off. Jackson King, I have, have, have often felt, is an underutilized character. You get someone who's like a Cyclops who becomes a Professor X throughout the, the various iterations of Jackson's character trajectory. And nevertheless... Real bad things throughout that character trajectory very often happen to Jackson King, the first of which is dying in battle in Stormwatch 16. So it was clear to me that in order to properly do an Amanda Waller year one, the main antagonist of that book could not make it out of that book alive. And... Jackson, who has a character history of dying and being thwarted, while often being righteous, seemed to me the, the, the way to go. He's also someone who just, you know, because of Stormwatch's placement as, as kind of the hub around which the, the Wildstorm universe, when conceived as a universe, turns, the, the people that I think most sum up are most identifiable as Stormwatch are Jackson and Bendix because then afterwards mm -hmm. it's the tilt into the authority in which is yeah. a totally new or mostly new cast of characters. So I needed also someone we needed, the book needed someone who just sort of said wild storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely does. RIP to Jackson. I loved writing him. I loved writing the moments when we agreed. I loved writing the moments when we disagreed. I loved mm. Amanda. I loved writing Amanda in issue one, playing on his self-conception, knowing yeah. that the way to thwart him is to let him be seen the way he wants to be seen, which tells you a tremendous amount about Amanda, especially because throughout the book, one thing Amanda doesn't lie about, because I think Amanda would not lie about it, is the overwhelming amount of respect she has for this pioneering black superhero and the sincere regret she feels that she's pitted against him and is going to win. I and I think you had a did a really good high impact with his death as well. I mean, and that's a that's a hardcore fight scene to go out in. No, no one can say you did him like a chump. No, I really wanted to make sure that. So because there's so much talking in issues one and two, and it was always conceived of as a four issue series, issue three had to be a giant action issue. It had to be like, ep like every episode nine of Game of Thrones, right? It had to be like, or The Sopranos or, mm -hmm. or Breaking Bad or, or The Wire the issue where the shocking things happen, really shocking yeah. things, nonstop excitement. You don't know which way the story is going to go. The, and then like just throwing out like, I'm going to put Deathstroke on a jet ski. 
Like this, mm-hmm. this book's been a lot of talking. We're going to put jet, Deathstroke on a jet ski. <laughs> Kiss that baby goodbye. Yeah, the, the jet ski, you know, is not making it out of the issue. Yeah. I did just compare him to Punisher. Please sit with that, everyone. I wanted a scene in the middle that could be a characterizing moment for both of them. So there's a, a tactical question that Deathstroke needs to solve here that if he had, that if Battalion had just died when Deathstroke shot the energy lance at the hotel, wouldn't have been a problem, which is that mm-hmm. the energy lance is kicked. And that's the only weapon Deathstroke has that can take out Battalion. So when he, when when Battalion comes out of the hotel, Deathstroke is is stalling and improvising. And so he finds with one of the the yachts in in the in the bay an yeah. opportunity to put Jackson on the horns of a dilemma. Does he kill Slade or does he save these people that Slade has just basically doomed? And of mm-hmm. course Battalion who we have with Amanda in the previous issue, referencing Langston Hughes talking about knowing rivers and Jackson talking about him pulling people out of rivers. Obviously, Jackson is going to to save the people on that yacht while then we can show Slade running into like a power switching station and charging the energy lance and then getting Jackson once again to chase him so that he can get, so Jackson will finally be mad enough to not like energy blast him, but go close enough up to him that Slade can use the lance on him. And I thought that was a pretty like good way that we could carry action throughout the issue. If there is like a power problem to solve that that Slade has to solve and show how formidable Jackson is right before we kill him. Yeah, definitely expertly done. And just also the dynamic of like everybody on the boat being like, please don't let us die. And just the image of like him having to carry all these like party goers semi naked. They're like, thanks. It's a very juxtaposition. I also got to to do a little bit of the, I I got to reference in that scene, they tell him, thank you for your service. For your service, Um, yeah. Yeah, like the, the classic thing that people, civilians with no familiarity with or attachment to the military will sort of lazily throw out there so they can go back to never thinking about it again. It's really perfect in that moment. It's the the surface of having us not drown in, in the water. But no, that, that whole issue was amazing. I mean, you, you, you found a new, well, you found a wonderful excuse to have Wintergreen show up and uh, that was creepy. Fun, yeah. But uh, a lot of folks were really amazed. I didn't realize there's a real deep character pull you had there. I am forgetting the name of the, the little person. because I Jacob Marlowe, Lord Imp from yes. Wildcats. Yes, from Wildcats. So like having him show up, he's he seems like he's there on some other kind of intel work. Perhaps? Yes, this was so much fun to write. So another great Evan Narciss idea. When we were doing, when, when, when I was doing the page breakdowns for the scenes for issue three, it came clear pretty quickly that Lois needed to be interviewing someone who could do an exposition dump and narrative exposition dump. There's stuff we have to explain about Cybernary. And in particular, we need the reveal that the name we know her by is not her real name. And then we can get to another Wildstorm, like classic character pull reference with Ivana Bayul. Um, I didn't know who that character that Lois was going to be interviewing was. And I was texting Evan. I was just like, this is an opportunity to throw in a Wildstorm character, but I don't know who this should be. Who should this be? And he was like, this should be Jacob Marlowe. Who's, for those who are not familiar, Jacob Marlowe, who is a Jim Lee drawing meant to evoke Jack Kirby, is this alien from this race called the Carabim who are basically like sponsoring the Carabim slash human hybrids who make up the wildcats. And Lord Amp is the one who's kind of the shot caller behind this team. He runs something called the Halo Corporation, which funds wildcats activities as well as sort of like 
his own machinations and and out basically like a essentially like a forward outpost for the care of him in this like endless intergalactic war. And when he shows up in Wildcats number one, he's destitute and like basically in, a, in his flop era. And I thought it would be fun to have flop era Jacob Marlowe, who at this point is passing is, is like doing espionage work, but also like mm-hmm. is working as a janitor and probably needs that money. Um, and I loved writing that character. That became such a fun character to, to hear his extremely irritable voice in my head as like, I, I could make him everyone who I've ever interviewed who wanted to be doing anything but talking to me. One of the big themes that sort of emerges from all of this is trafficking and the woman who has to become to be the initial cybernary unit driver who was then murdered so they can steal the technology. She didn't even want to have to wear it in the first place. What made you want to bring that into the story? So in my day job, I'm a national security reporter. I've reported from Iraq and Afghanistan and been to both of those places and seen how reliant the U.S. military, particularly when deployed to a war zone, is on for-profit businesses. And part of seeing that is seeing what their labor force is. And oftentimes that labor force in military jargon will be reduced to the acronym TCN. TCN stands for third country nationals. What that means is the the Halliburtons, the triple canopies, the Blackwaters, the Fluors, on and on. The, the companies that make money off servicing not like a military like production complex, but a military deployed for war. Its labor force is imported from throughout the developing world. In a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, it was not the case that, I mean, this would be a perverse rationale for a war, even if it were true, but I'm just Mm -hmm. pointing out the destructive and extractive elements of such an enterprise when I say that these were not employment opportunities, the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan for Iraqis or Afghans. Mm -hmm. This was for an imported labor force that would work at in incredibly dangerous places under incredibly dangerous conditions for vastly below any prevailing wage that would be offered to someone who was even a citizen of those countries. Very often, that labor force was coerced. War, we don't, I think even us, even we in national security journalism don't emphasize this to the degree that we should. And I certainly include myself in this. And that inclusion is what spurred me to put this in the comic. Hmm. War as an enterprise of profit relies on unfree labor. Trafficking is part, no one will ever put it in these terms, but trafficking is so frequent, the sources of it, of that labor, so coterminous with how human trafficking works as to make it a reasonable reading that this is part of the business model. What often happens, and obviously... I'm basically using the mutilation of Ivana Bayul slash Katrina Cupertino as she's renamed for the purposes of cataloging her powers. I'm using the superhero elements of that as a way to speak to how in unfree labor, your body is violated. And obviously, this is going to also be a gendered thing. And I wanted to make clear that, and I, I, this is also the meaning of the, the last page in the comic, 
when we have Ivana's parents talking and Lois quoting. Yeah. Yeah. The point of that is to show that these wars, these enterprises that are seen up on Skywatch as routine create Ivana Bayouls. They generate them. They create markets for them. And never up on Skywatch will you see Ivana Bayoul or or understand how she was a chess champion. How right. we have as a nod also to the Ivana Bayoul character in Wildstorm Canon, we have uh Jacob Marlowe say in issue three that she's so smart that in a different world she would have run an intelligence agency, which is what she does in Wildstorm. But here she's sacrificed. Here we're using checkmate as an institutional player in, in our narrative. She's the pawn that's sacrificed. And yeah. it, it was important to me that when we introduce that in issue one, that Lois seizes on it, that that is the moment when she sees Ivana's face from the rendition. That's the moment in the, in the interview she's doing with Battalion in issue one, where she stops being able to hold back calling him on his bullshit and where like their relationship blows up in that issue is because she sees that he, despite showing her this picture of Ivana, he's only been seeing her as a means to the end of getting Amanda. And Lois calls him on that. And Lois shames Jackson because there's an element of truth to that. And also, Jackson, who's had to see her body up close, what he says is he thought this was something that could finally stop Amanda. He sees Amanda's violation of Ivana as the same crime that Lois does. But now he sees that Lois recognizes that he also used Ivana as a means to an end. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always thought it was really powerful to have the story conclude with her parents again and having Michael, of all people, of course, like bringing the body home. Yeah. This is also a reference to canonical usage of death blow. Death blow is, is this premier Wildstorm tier one operative veteran of every dirty war you can think of plagued by regret go back to the original jim lee and then tim sale death blow book an incredible book one of the most visually stunning comics i think ever you get Mm. not only do you get jim lee experimenting with his thick blacks frank miller sin city style probably the most abstraction that we we see from jim lee but then afterwards, you get early career Tim Sale. Yeah, that's a team up. That's but a team up. I wanted, I wanted us to never lose sight of Ivana, even when to, Lois keeps investigating her. Mm-hmm. After the, the blow up with her editor in issue one over his and the Daily Planet's disinterest in recording the the intentions of a revolutionary guerrilla group fighting for its people's survival against a U.S. backed power. The thing that kind of snaps her out of the issue one failure after failure professionally is is seeing in issue three something that strikes her as a coincidence worth investigating about Katrina Cupertino, who we then learn is really named Ivana Bayul. And that's kind of where the battery starts recharging in Lois again. And we see Mm -hmm. in issue three, the tenacious reporter that we know Lois Lane is. I really like all of the journalistic, uh, I mean, I don't want to say narration, but uh, journalistic narration bubbles of her article that appear throughout this issue. It's like very nice to have that actually be written by a journalist. <laughs> that was, yeah. The ch- can I just say the hardest part of writing this book was that the hardest part fit. I had to, cause it was like, okay, 
now write a certain slant in broadsheet style narrative lead, like Sunday paper, Sunday edition of of the New York Times, the Observer mm-hmm. instead of um, the the Guardian of the previous three issues. Use this to give the reader everything they need to know going into issue four and knowing that like the handoff of the Lois Lane expose is going to be the congressional hearing where Amanda and Adelina raked over the coals. So that was so many drafts. Hmm. And also it, it has to do the work and in the, and be in the vernacular of a piece of journalism, but also has to like pair amplify or contrast with the visual element. The visuals in it. That's, and that's it has on to the fit page. in these yeah. tiny little and blocks. To, you can't go long. Like, well, that's credit to, to Dave. Sh- that's credit to Dave Sharp because mm-hmm. our letter on the book is making sure that I, I got to be wordy within the confines of letting this art breathe. And that's all his genius. It's just really impressive. Yeah. And I think this, the, that final issue just really pulls it in its full strength there for sure. Well, thank um, you, thank you very much. It was really the it was really kind of a moment where I got to write a Lois Lane story. I don't just mean like I got to write like a story that involves Lois Lane, which I did, which still blows me away. But then I got to write Lois Lane's journalism. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. That was a kick. Yeah, that it's really a perfect pairing, and I, I'm excited that they like saw that and 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 and, and played into that. One of the other things from this has been the whole dynamic with Adeline Kane and Waller and jockeying for power uh, between them and pivoting between who wants to be credited for what and who wants to hold the bag for what. I'm imagining this is something you probably witnessed a lot in the real world as well. Yeah, this was this was a like this was the challenge of issue four. The challenge of issue four was I need to have by the, like we're going to challenge of issue four was that I needed lots of reversals to happen in very little page space at the end, at like the tail end of the book, that it was going to be like several languid pages, sometimes visually spectacular pages of Amanda finally like rising above earth. She's won so much that she's mm-hmm. getting in issue one. We start talking about like the wonder of dreaming that they could be on storm watch, that they could be on sky watch, uh, Amanda and battalion. That is the responsibility they feel to get there, to make sure that there are black people on sky watch, which as you see in the final issue, there are not except for Amanda. And here she is. And that all has to breathe. And with the breathing of it comes a, a sort of sense of security that the reader like might then feel that we need like in basically five pages toward the end, do at least three twists. Mm-hmm. And we had set up early on that Adeline is the power here, the established power. And Amanda has just like she did Jackson in earning trust and and wearing down his defenses through letting him be seen the way he wants to be seen. She did that to Adeline as well, that she is solving Adeline's dilemma. Jackson correctly sees that in issue two by being like the Waller we know from the 80s suicide squad who puts the bomb in the back of your head and blows it up. We're referencing that by having her like capable of understanding how metahuman powers can be metabolized in the body through essentially human experiments. And Adeline, we have Amanda saying outright thinks that this plan that has been put into motion is her plan. Amanda has manipulated her that well. Amanda is that good at this. Obviously, we're honoring the characters she she is in the in the DCU mainline. Um, and 
Also, there's no way around it. Dynamic is heavily racialized. That the way we have Adeline throughout the book talk to Amanda is nurturing when it serves her interests and then very quickly turning on Amanda to put her in her place and telling Mm -hmm. her again and again, like with Slade, you never talk to me like that when Slade is on the line. After on the line, Amanda hearing from Adelaide, you're in charge of this mission. And then when Amanda says, but you said I was in charge of this mission. And she goes, I said you were in charge of this mission, letting her know she is never actually in charge. They can share cigarettes, but the relationship is never going to be one stripped of this power dynamic. And by issue four, we see Amanda taking, as Adeline puts it, taking a bullet for Amanda by saying that what happened in Gamora, now that it's exposed on the front page of the Daily Planet, was Amanda's operation. In the limousine scene, Adeline tells Amanda, you know, well, I know you like to tell people that Gamora was your idea. So essentially, again, asserting dominance, asserting control over her black subordinate. And then says, and it's a single, it's the only balloon in the panel because we're going to need to subvert it later. We have her throwing in Amanda's face in a scene that's supposed to indicate like a degree of care after Amanda takes this bullet. Now you got that in the committee record. But of course, Adeline doesn't realize, and Amanda does, that she has just in fact done exactly that, put in the Senate Intelligence Committee record that Amanda Waller was the one who pulled off this operation that to this Senate committee, and from there the Senate and from there the power structure, all the way up to the weatherman, recognizes is this amazing coup of American power, like this, this, this flawless covert operation that redounds exponentially to the expansion of American power. And Adeline doesn't realize that it's in that moment she had lost control. Right. By the right. time, no, they, and it's, but it's clear to us. It's, it's very clear to us. And by the yeah. time we get up onto Skywatch, Adeline, w- the moment that she's reeling, that she's just been told she didn't get the thing that she wanted and that she expected, and that we've written the issue to kind of set up as an expectation, and we've written the series to set up the expectation. That's why we have like Marlowe say in issue three, if you can pull this off, this is the kind of shit that gets you made weatherman. We learn that Adeline is not going to be weatherman at a moment where it's still possible that Amanda might. And then only when Amanda, when Adeline is then weakened, does Amanda strike and realizing that she can end the threat from, from Adeline right then and there and does. Yeah, let's talk about the dynamics of that scene. Well, for one thing, I thought it was so exciting to see Angie Spica's powers being used and like this moment of everybody having the joy of flight and then like washing it all off and getting back down to the dirty, dirty business of what they were actually doing. I I think that like a lot of writers and a lot of audiences have very different takes on what Stormwatch is Was it ever actually good or able to do good things? Was this all a terrible idea from the start? And like, what what has happened in Stormwatch, uh, in the world in which you're telling this story, etc.? I was excited to see, oh, look, it's Bendix. I'm someone who mostly read the Stormwatch. Like, I only read that stuff after, like, what I read, I got into the authority and then read Stormwatch. In, in the end of Stormwatch in retrospect. So like I, I wasn't there on the journey from the beginning. So I can't speak about like what it's like, what it was like reading it from the beginning and feeling like, look at these heroes. I'm curious, uh, how were you thinking about editorializing on giving, like in this situation, you were saying that Stormwatch wasn't yet UN in the story there. And that it's, uh, I love that it's Amanda's idea to say that it should be UN. If you pick up, The collected edition next year, I have an essay in the back of the book about this. Uh. And 
I just want to say that the way I approached it was to leave that question open for debate and then introduce characters who are going to debate it and who are going to have different points of view about it. And that's Lois, Mm -hmm. Battalion, and Amanda. Battalion thinks that it was this good thing that got corrupted. We used, and, and here I should be clear, like I am like not using Stormwatch very traditionally. I am because the mandate of this was to mash together DCU stuff and Wildstorm stuff. I got to be a little bit like um, unorthodox with mm-hmm. how this worked together. So just to give the overview, I used the DC organization checkmate because in the 1980 as as the big kind of like intelligence agency that that we were yeah. going here, we could have done Argus, we could have done the DEO. Um, but no, but, checkmate is the right one. Well, because I'm old school. I like checkmate was totally the right pull for this. Like I thought canonically checkmate in the 1980s is this weird federal superhero employing civil rights agency with really good branding by the time harvey bullock is in it for some reason um it's a weird book Uh, by the time we get to greg rucker writing checkmate in either the late 2000s early 2010s i forget when when his run was it's um, i think it's 2000 checkmate is basically like the, this world security, this global security apparatus um, with with a UN connection and so on. Stormwatch in the very first iteration of Wildstorm are the UN superheroes. So once I'm mashing, once I'm taking that away um, and, and Stormwatch is commanded from this satellite in the sky called Skywatch, and the person who runs Skywatch is essentially one of, if not the most powerful people in the world, essentially the intelligence director of a global security agency, Henry Bendix, the weatherman. There will be different people who are weathermen over the years. Jackson will become weatherman. Jackson King, yeah. Jackson will become weatherman. Christine Trelane, his wife, will also be weatherman. Anyway, but here... I needed Battalion to work for Checkmate, but still be in charge of a superhero team within Checkmate called Stormwatch, which we would draw from and like have, you know, several, not really main, main characters, but like Winter, who's an underboss, who uh, Mm -hmm. is honestly, I'll be, I'll be honest in this interview. Winter is the character in this book who, if you are a fan of, you have a right to be mad at me. <laughs> we, yeah. our, we, Winter is not characterized in Waller versus Wildstorm the way Winter is characterized in the rest of, of his character appearances. But I needed a character here to be villainous and also for him to be meaningful. And so yeah. Winter kind of had to play that role, rationalize it as in Elseworlds or just be mad at me. It's, it's, I will <laughs> completely accept that it is fair, you, the winter fandom, whoever you are, to be mad at me for, for what I do to your boy in this book. Anyway, Stormwatch is now this team within Checkmate out of necessity of the way I'm writing this thing. But Checkmate, like the other elements of the intelligence community in this book, are ultimately run slash determined by Skywatch, which we're basically saying is super in charge of checkmate the 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 check checkmate's boss's boss and we do a little intelligence community reshuffling in a scene that i wanted to write as like operatic over the top absurd bureaucratic and farcical achievement lawn locked but yeah i'm really looking forward to reading your essay when it comes out because i you're yeah you're someone whose thoughts i have about the whole question of un superhero agency bodies like i'm curious what you think about it in a way that i'm sorry to say it to the general public not super interested in what they have to say about it i have been a party to so many inane conversations i love you all truly and all of my listeners you surely have highly informed opinions and are not the, the average joe but whatever you but yeah that's that's the thing i'm really looking forward to seeing for sure 
Well, what I was trying to do is is just make it clear that like there are different ways to answer this question. There are different ways to address mm-hmm. this question. That was this thing always corrupted is something that you will see different answers for in the book. You see in issue one that Lois Lane like really gets under Jackson's skin by saying essentially like you work for an intelligence agency. Are you shocked that it became brutal and depraved? (laughs) And like, he's really offended by that because he's exactly the sort of person who would be really offended by that. And he takes that as a sign of Lois dismissing all of the sacrifices that he's made throughout the years in his mind Mm -hmm. to keep people like her able to say such disrespectful shit. And and also the assumption that we think that everyone involved in it is ill-intended, which I don't, which I certainly don't think Lois thinks that. And, and, and that's, and, and that is exactly how I, having had versions of this conversation with sources over the years, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jackson immediately says that's bullshit. All you are saying is that we're all the same and our choices don't matter. And Lois tries to say that isn't what I meant. And he is yep. not willing to hear that. Like Lois is yep. blo- Lo- Lois is really blown it in this moment. I yeah. wonder how a journalist ever operate. You know, anyway. Mm-hmm. However, did I come up no. with that? Yeah. Her, her anxiety, <laughs> her anxiety freak out in the bathroom. Yeah. Definitely real as fuck. But yeah, like what I think it's interesting how everybody keeps reflecting back on Checkmate's civil rights charter as such a such a quirky notion that that is where the security that it's just that it's a government agency with a civil rights charter that is then the one that becomes where superhero metahuman I should say uh, powers get to be located within DC. The fact that that existed as canon in the the Paul Kupferberg. Yep. Steve Irwin checkmate was just like this enormous gift to my specific story and my specific way of thinking that mm-hmm. like I couldn't make that I like I couldn't leave that I couldn't leave that on the table. That 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 absolutely had to be part of the rationale for this apparatus existing and for these various people, one of whom is Amanda, exploiting it. In order to to expand American power and all the exploitative and expropriative and violent aspects of it. Um, and we have Bendis at the end, like being as cynical about it as can be and saying like we, we when we when we essentially destroy the the organization that gave us this gift because of how it was constructed as a civil rights agency, as we destroy that, the only thing that we're going to retain is the mandate and we drape the rest of our operations in it to make them seem righteous. Sounds very, very real. Oh yes. Let's talk about Kaisen Gamora's emergence in the end of the, uh, yes. in the end of the book. My goodness. Okay. So there are only two characters in the first three issues who we talk about without seeing. One of them is the weatherman and the other is Kaizen Gamora. So it only made sense that by the time we got to this scene in issue four with the weatherman, that Kaizen is also there. That as we establish, um, if you can't tell in the second issue with Yumiko and Amanda in, in essentially Gamora Tower, which is Metro Bank Tower at that point, the statue in the lobby is of Kaizen Gamora shaking hands with JFK. So we've established that Kaizen Gamora is from the very first page of the book, that like Kaizen Gamora is this long-standing American ally in the Pacific, but something of a wary one. Someone who who like understands in a clear-eyed way that while he is happy to use Um, the power of the U S military for his advantages, that relationship is going to have to have limits if he wants to be like the head honcho that he wants to be. And so he's got to have found a way to 
get himself up on Skywatch. And this character is like one of, like from the very first issue of The Authority, a like major Wildstorm villain in this classic Wildstorm locale, the island of Gamora. And getting to like borrow his voice for a while was was part of the comic relief, but also like bitter comic relief that that scene in particular had to have. So here is Kaizen shitting all over this plan and explaining how Yumiko has in fact behaved foolishly. That Yumiko, as we've set up in, in the previous three issues, Yumiko and in, in the, the Lois Lane expose, what Yumiko is doing and what Amanda has gotten to do with Yumiko is vastly expand like America's investment in Gamora by making her so supremely powerful that she will then be able to make Gamora into this massive financial juggernaut that allows foreign capital, American capital, to pour into Gamora and from there dominate the markets of the Pacific, both material and financial. This is Amanda Waller's tremendous victory, really a Kissinger level victory. And Kaizen gets to be the one who says in that moment, this is doomed. Yumiko thinks she can conquer the people of Gamora who I didn't conquer because I realized I would never be able to conquer them. Eventually, they are not going to be fooled by Yumiko's US-provided power enhancements. They'll find the Achilles heel and they'll exploit it. She'll have no choice but to come running back to you American superheroes and become deeper and deeper in debt to them. So at that yeah. point, Kaizen is basically explaining how Yumiko has made herself in that sense like Katrina Cupertino slash Ivana Bayul. And she's a permanent client state of America from then on. And this and is also gonna... one of the, the reasons why Cybernary is so confusing in this book and is so many people in this book is because in the original Wildstorm comics, she's literally a Gestalt character. Like she's two, like she's multiple people sometimes, she's different people at other times. So I oh did my. want, I wanted to play with that if we were going to have Cybernary in this, but I wanted to have Kaizen, who's about to just, who's basically like giving the, we all know it's not actually a panel in Watchmen, it's a composite panel, but like the Dr. Manhattan meme, I am sick of these people, their lives. You know, yeah, like, I'm going I, off to space. I'm now. going off to space. Fuck you people. I'm so sick. I've been dealing with you people for decades. You're exhausting. She, he's telling, like, he's insulting Bendis to his face. Bendis responding using, like, the the unbothered diplomatic language of the career bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. Insult me to my face all, all you like. I have the power here. Well, just the whole thing of, like, him just being on that. After we believe he's been dead. After, we're, I think we were led to believe he's dead. We right? just have no we're idea. Just like, we just leave it, like, Ka Kaizen Gamora's time is over. Yumiko is now, yeah. quote, unquote, president-elect. She's yeah. a U.S. and bank installed, quote unquote, president. Um, I love the idea that he's still sitting around up in the saddle. He's up in the sky. Like, he's sick of, you know, you know. He goes, Yumiko can run my island. I don't give a shit. I'm going off yeah. into space. Yeah. No, Terrestrial destinies are not for Kaizen Gamora. It's, uh, you definitely see that like classic pulpy character quality to him as well, but it is, comes off like, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult balance to strike, and I think you guys got it. I re I really like that. Also, the same kind of challenge where like from that's a rough character design. Oh yes, and we it could be very not, racist very yes, easily. We did not <laughs> want to do that. At the same yeah. time, he has to be recognizable as Kaizen Gamora. So mm -hmm. I again another job that I thought Jesus did with tremendous skill and sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm not the best decider on such matters, but I definitely think so. It's like, yes, this is a person. Uh, and that is the first step to making this work because I think a lot of the artists don't draw him that way. Also, and I had a friend of mine perform a sensitivity read on the character design to make sure that we, we knew we were not 
committing any offensive or, or, or unforced errors from, from our own blind spots. Always a wise decision, indeed. But yeah, I mean, it really is like throughout this whole book, you're looking at all these 90s characters and having having the, some inner 90s this uh, maintain. Well, I think we talked about this a bit when you first came on, but like this is 80s espionage DC comic with the 90s characters that still feels fresh and not dated now is like a whole lot of time periods and feels to have to try to to thread and land. And it actually all sits together as a whole, which is pretty incredible. Well, thank so, you so much. I mean, yeah, I wanted to write something knowing that we were writing essentially a flashback book. I wanted to write something that used that to our narrative advantage that like made use of the way that when you when it is that you read the book, you know how the intervening years went in terms of mm. both American history, world history and DCU slash Wildstorm history. So they like in the the scene with the scene with Amanda and Battalion in the second issue is really where I, I try and do this the hardest. We have Amanda telling Battalion that this unipolar moment, this moment of supreme power that it looks like the United States has finally attained as its only geopolitical rival ha and has crumbled at the end of the Cold War, that's going to fade fast. That's going to fade faster than anyone wants to think about. And unless America figures out ways of keeping itself perpetually great, the social devastation that that dislocation that realization of decline or fear of decline, even if it's not materially grounded, will create that dislocation will be unbelievably savage. And we mm -hmm. in the vantage point of 2023 have reason to nod our heads along to that and see the prescience of what Amanda Waller is saying. In that matter, we get to use her foreknowledge of the savagery of what's on its way by virtue of how well she knows America to get her to do this incredibly destructive, like shocking geopolitical act. That rationale for her comes from the difference in time periods from when the book takes place to what we as readers know happened in the interim. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it's it, and I don't I don't know that I've seen something else do that. Sure, you have. I'm I stole it from Watchmen. <laughs> no, I okay, sure, that's a good example. Um, hmm. Now I'm going to think about my brain is a little bit fried right now. But I definitely think it's something that is not utilized a lot, in part because I think that a lot of people don't trust their audience to know anything about history. Well, and hopefully, I mean, if you're if you don't, then I don't think you're missing anything. But if you do, then I think you you get some uh, some perhaps like deeper engagement with the book and its themes. Well, even if you don't know history, also I, I just mean even like within our own lives, like they're within our own lifespans as well. But I mean, I hope that it's written in such a way that you don't have to be someone super focused on contemporary history or someone who is a news junkie or anything like that to, to enjoy it and to even more fundamentally to follow it. I hope it's written in such a way that if you are not one of those things, you still have enough of this, like it convey, it tracks enough with the way that you perceive the development of the stuff around you during your adult life that we were supposed to be the most powerful nation there was. Oh, and it turns out that there's still quite a lot of damage that can be done to such a nation and the way it interprets those setbacks have real consequences. And that's just sort of like vaguely enough in the air, I think, 
that hopefully the story resonates. Yeah. I'm, I guess I just think about the times where people are like, remember how nobody did X, Y, and Z. And you're like, I was there. I like people's, yeah. Like, Oh, nobody protested against the Iraq war. I'm like, everybody protested against the Iraq war and the media didn't cover it. Right. In great millions. Right. Yeah. That's why be that's why blogs became for everybody who's like, I hate the internet. Like I understand why you say that, but do you understand what it was like before that? We would protest in millions and the press wouldn't cover it. Okay? <laughs> like if you there's a reason why if you we try, blog. If you try and read the mainstream coverage of the nineteen ninety nine WTO protest, they make no sense. Mm-hmm. You learn nothing. You- no, they're absolutely insane. The they remind me of the recent New York Times coverage of the protest in the New York Times, where in the New York Times claimed that protesters, anti-war, anti, uh, anti, uh, anti-war protesters in the New York Times, you know, just were wandering in there for unknown reasons and left. When in reality, as I believe Reuters reported, they had brought in flyers that were like fake New York Times newspaper covers telling the story of how the war needs to stop. Like, clearly, these were not random people wandering in the New York Times. Many of them were, in fact, former New York Times reporters going into the New York Times, handing out leaflets, and the New York Times refused to actually say what had happened there. I know you're new here, but this is the Daily Planet, Lois. We don't print propaganda. That was such a perfect moment. Steve Lombard, you dick. If there are several... I did not have to kill all my darlings in Waller versus Wildstorm, and that is definitely one of them. I, I, I get to present a certain kind of editor that exists in journalism, prone to say something like that when confronted with reporting like Lois's. Like one of the things that will sit with me, and this is not an editor, but one of the things that will sit with me forever was I was at the RNC protests in 2000 in Philadelphia and I saw cops like beating up middle-aged and elderly Quaker ladies because they were protesting against the RNC. Yes, quite dangerous. And those were the Philly cops and that's what Philly cops do. And I saw like TV news crews there not filming this. And I ran up to these guys and was like, why aren't you filming this? This seems like... Good television is, in fact, I believe the words I used, and they just sort of shrugged and turned away. And I'm like, they get, they just know it's not going to get aired, or they, they don't want to have it be used like in the countersuit when protesters successfully sue the city for millions of dollars after getting beaten and incarcerated illegally for protesting. Like what? Like they're not even going to film it. It wasn't their and, assignment. They're, and they're, they're assigned to yeah. cover that. They're assigned to cover that convention, and that is what. They are going to be judged for doing, and they are not there to do spot news. And I'm not saying that this is good mm-hmm. reasoning. I'm saying that this is reasoning that's actually out there and kind of structurally determined. Uh, I mean, these were not people like in the convention center. This is all outside. So they were there to cover the protests. Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's significantly worse. Yes, <laughs> Because I don't know why else they would have had cameras like out. I misunderstood like, you. Were, okay, yeah. No, no, yeah. I, they were, yeah. It was mind blowing, and I'm like, so this doesn't get to be on TV, even though this is obviously from the shallowest means good television. And like for the longest time, I felt completely hopeless in our ability to do anything meaningful about political change because without journalism reporting about what people were doing, I was like, there's no fucking hope. And then the internet. Suddenly we had the read write web in which people like me who aren't coders didn't need to beg press to cover things. We could post directly to the web and everything suddenly felt like we had a chance to be seen again. And, and people who would not know to look for left-wing news sources could accidentally stumble on them. Right. Cause like the nation magazine for whom you are now the foreign policy columnist writing your writing your column forever wars for the nation magazine many people i mean they, at any point people could be reading the nation but many people don't know to look for that they don't know to they don't know they what they need or look for to need is left journalism but through this whole wacky internet thing uh, even people who don't know that they're looking for left-wing journalism can stumble on it and learn something and what a huge moment that was in politics for what was possible 
And that's why uh, I am on Twitter still, I guess. But anyway, I, uh, I was trying to spend less time there, but uh, and more time on Blue Sky, where you and I both are, in fact. Much better vibes. I mean, yes, it, it feels like old Twitter, that's for sure. But I just give that as an example of like, because I don't know, I mean, I'm as down about internet as anybody but i also think a lot of folks aren't quite old enough to remember what things were like before it yeah and it doesn't have to be a kind of gauzy valorization we in those days the tone and tenor of the conversation was pretty much the same thing that like uh the the blogs were destroying the civility at the heart of Mm -hmm. democracy These were uh, people who were like driving down the cost of expert commentary. Like it was seen as this uncouth thing that was different from mainstream media rather than symbiotic with it and oftentimes exposing the dubious relevance of of many like traditional media vestiges, particularly like the opinion columnist, which is still a very strange hybrid thing that's somewhere between mm-hmm. poster and journalist. And all the most paid ones are the least journalist and most random ass poster ones. Yeah. What other thing in terms of like the journalistic presentation in Waller versus Wildstorm? Mm-hmm. By the time this comes out, there will be an essay about this on my newsletter, Forever Wars, which you can read at foreverwars.ghost.io. But there's a moment after the Senate hearing ends when Amanda and Adeline are in the limousine being driven to Checkmate HQ to eventually go see the weatherman. And they've won. Like the Senate Intelligence Committee makes it clear that like, they're not going to be disciplined for the events mm-hmm. of the previous three issues. They're they're going to be celebrated that this was amazing. This was a tremendous, tremendous win. The Daily Planet is calling this a scandal because these these dumb liberals don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And in a sense, like Lois Lane fails. Like right. the journalism doesn't stop the thing. Yumiko is still in charge of Gamora. Adeline gets a promotion. Amanda's won. Um, and I wanted there to be that kind of dislocation that like we start, Lois is the first recognizable character we meet in this story. And as we go through the book, Lois is reporting the story as we, as we see it unfold before our eyes, we see the differences between what we know as readers and what Lois knows, what Lois Um, has had access to in this story is much narrower than what we as readers have had access to. Um, And so that that's reflected in the, in the story, the, the convert what's not reflected in Lois's story is the conversation that Amanda has with Jackson in issue two, because in issue three, Mm -hmm. we see Jackson burn that tape. Her, her story reflects in a lot of ways the conversation that Slade has with Jackson in issue three, because Jackson is interrupted before he can burn that tape. And Lois gets it in at the, in the, in the, on the, on the final page of issue three. So Mm -hmm. Lois, this, this story that we've seen her pursue, the story doesn't stop the thing that she exposes. And there are a couple ways you can look at that. One is journalism failed. Another way, and this is the way that I look at it, is a recognition that power, in order to be power, doesn't shatter on impact with journalism. Journalism's power doesn't really work that way. It only does in the most exceptional of cases. Watergate. To take an example that I was personally involved in, there's only one time that I've gotten, because of journalism that I worked on, a law changed. And that was a surveillance law that got changed because of Edward Snowden's NSA leaks published in The Guardian, The Washington Post. I was part of the team working on it at The Guardian. And 
the law that got changed only applied to the smallest slice of the surveillance that we exposed. Vastly most most of it got left intact. And even the, the part that the law that changed ultimately failed under the weight of so much continued surveillance. Yeah. Did we fail or was there still value in us exposing the truth about NSA surveillance? You can reasonably look at it in from either of those perspectives. I am not going to be so arrogant as to say that the one I disagree with is invalid. I can see the argument for it in like my moments of anxiety and depression and self-doubt. I articulate it very clearly, but also I maintain that there is value in the truth for its own sake, in exposing something that power hides for its own sake, even if you have to recognize that history doesn't work in a way that one piece of journalism makes power suddenly fall to pieces. But journalism can be part of the mosaic that gets a people's collective memory and shared experience forged to understand the forces that are arrayed against them. And when they act together and force that power to concede, that is how history changes. And journalism can play a role there. Yes, yeah, speaking of from an organizer's perspective, like we need these things because it is part of how we talk to other people who need to be mobilized. It's, it's such a valuable validator. People don't just trust you when you're like, look, you should believe me because I'm from this community, because I've seen this, because I've experienced this. Being able to point to, we need to do something and here's some proof that I'm not fucking crazy is like very powerful. And it's a, it's a useful tool, which of course is why it's always frustrating when journalists don't want to hear from us. Absolutely. <laughs> and don't have an interest in challenging power and have an interest mm-hmm. in cultivating power and convincing themselves that it's the same thing. Or that they're so cynical that like they, I don't know what they think it is that we're after. To manipulate the record. It's just like. That's, that's what it so, is. So Yeah, but for what end? Like, what do they think I'm getting out of this? Like, oh, no, they they want the world to be less terrible. Treat that person with huge suspicion. Are they all thinking we're getting some check from George Soros? God, I wish. It's like... It's not that deep. It's oftentimes it's it's just sort of a lazy, self-justifying way of uh, making a habit of mind and a habit of newsroom seem noble. But um, because I don't believe that Lois's journalism as a stand-in for journalism in general that can't, you know, foil the plans of Amanda Waller, um, you know, by virtue of of existing, I still believe that that kind of journalism is powerful. And that's why we pause Lois's story, but then we resume it at the end. Mm. And by the time we get to the end, we're realizing that what Lois is doing is ensuring that someone bore witness to the life of Ivana Bayul and the struggles of General Wrong in the PLA and found the thread, American power, that doomed both of these things, that acts as it does at home, as it does abroad because it's one thing. And that I wanted to kind of leave along with Kaizen is telling the weatherman, is telling everyone, is telling the reader as well, the people that Yumiko conquered will never stay conquered. Those are, that, those are his words in that scene. Yumiko is now selling herself because she doesn't realize that that is the course she has forced herself on. The people will never stay defeated. And when they are preparing for what will become their triumph, among the things they will reach for 
in their collective memory to fortify themselves, to validate their struggles, to communicate down through the generations what had happened will be stories like Lois Lane's. And it's certainly meaningful to the family. Well, I want to make sure we take some time to get to some listener questions that we got in from folks. I'm going to start off. A literator asks, is there any character you wanted to include but were told was off limits or because it was black label, were you given carte blanche? So the answer is yes. There were um, a couple characters in particular. Virgil Hawkins, static, mm-hmm. to be, to be yeah. in this. The role that would become... It was actually... I'm glad frankly, that I got told no, because like, I don't think I would have been like, I couldn't make it a static book. But anyway, this was a moot point. Because like, when we were um, plotting this out, like who I got to use from the the DC character sandbox, after I'd come up with like, my like first very, very rough draft for like, who could be in this? I asked, um, could I use Wildstorm characters? Because originally this was like Suicide Squad. And I asked, could I use Wildstorm characters? And said, yeah, absolutely. We can we can definitely do that. And that was kind of the genesis for this becoming Waller versus Wildstorm. And then I asked, could I use Milestone characters? Because at the time, the Milestone relaunch hadn't happened yet. But mm. little did I know, it was like very, very soon in coming. And the groundwork for what um, the the milestone 30th anniversary relaunch treatments would be was already in motion. So I couldn't do that. Then I asked mm-hmm. if I could use Tim Drake, who's my favorite Robin. Ah. And they said like, uh, wow. I can, I'm sorry. I'm not surprised he's no, favorite Robin. I'm just, I'm in sort of like, I'm trying to imagine what he would be like in this story. But continue. No, continue. I didn't really have a good idea either. Like this was very much at the stage where I wanted to just kind of grab my favorites. And, and then see, like, what I would be able to do with them. But, like, they, Chris Conroy, my really excellent editor, who I owe all of this book to, made the very good point that if this is a flashback story, then we would be deal Like, it, the time period in the DCU that, that we are kind of playing with and referencing, even though it's not, like, a hard and fast thing, Tim mm-hmm. isn't Robin yet. And what would that really mean for a story like this? Like, would I just be basically like tormenting a tween Tim Drake? Like, and like, yeah, like sense, like better to, to kind of avoid the. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, brain is just like, what? No, I would have, I, I, I was definitely more like, I, I I'll it. find a way to use Tim, but no, God and it's, it. we'll be, find- it's, it's better that it's better that. Why? What, is there a quick way to tell me why he's your favorite Robin? Yeah, because he's the one who deserved to be Robin. He's the one mm. who earned it by pro- by figuring out as the world's greatest detective, certainly in that moment, that Bruce Wayne was Batman. He doesn't try yeah. and steal the hubcaps off the Batmobile like, like Jason does. He's not a reiteration of Batman himself that Batman right. thinks he can kind of make a second version of himself like Dick is. Dick is a fantastic character, but like Dick to me is Nightwing and is better as yeah. Nightwing. Yeah. And yeah. I loved him as right. And he's also not like Bruce Wayne's literal son. Um, yeah. Con- contrived as a, like a vengeance plot by Rush Al Ghul, which as cool <laughs> as I think that concept is, like, you know, Damien inherits being Robin. Tim earns being Robin. And that's yeah. why Tim is my favorite Robin. And I also really love um, the Jeff Johns Teen Titans run when when Tim is like properly Robin on the Teen Titans. Cool. Cool. Uh, local astronaut asks uh, why he chose the Wildstrom characters he chose, not remotely the most popular ones. Which, of course, is a why, part of why I think you can do cool stuff with them is because they're not. But Oh, yeah. Canon's in it. I wanted Canon in it because Canon canonically, like from literally the second issue of Stormwatch in 1993, is an asshole. And he and Jackson butt heads. So I put Canon on the Team 7 team 
that's raising the El Salvadoran village. Um, and because that's exactly the type of mission that Cannon would go on. And then in issue two, when Stormwatch saves Battalion, he makes a point of cracking that he was outvoted and didn't want to do it because the two of them just really don't get along. I wanted Fahrenheit on because by the time of the Tom Rainey, Warren Ellis, Stormwatch, Fahrenheit is like more of a central character. Fuji is really fun visually. Hellstrike is an en- is a narrative engine of the story. It was important that Hellstrike be a male character for his placement in the story because Hellstrike, if Hellstrike is, if the role that Hellstrike yeah. plays in this story is played by a woman, then I fridged someone. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was wise. I loved how you had him and Christine hanging out with Hellstrike, like on Coney Island. I recognize that boardwalk. Yes. Like in his flashback of like when he's killing, when he's killing Winter and he's like, this was my friend. I loved my friend and like, yes. fuck this. Like, I loved my friend. Yeah, it really, it, it definitely, it felt really genuine there. Yeah. And I, that panel was really important to me. The flashback pattern, that whole page where like you see the pain on mm-hmm. Jackson's face as he's killing his teammate because his teammate is responsible for Hellstrike's death. You know, there there are some references. You realized it like throughout issue one and then again in issue two. The th- like the thing that Jackson is really out to avenge is Hellstrike's death. You know, the first thing we learn, the first thing he tells Lois, he doesn't tell Lois about Katrina slash Ivana right then, or about Ignacio Rivas in Team 7, he says, she's the reason my friend is dead. And we see throughout those issues how that drove Jackson. We see Christine, his wife, say at the end of, of issue two, what is it exactly? They took Nigel from us. We have to go to Gamora to end this. And then, you know, there's the panel of them enjoying that that tender moment at Coney Island. That loss is really present for Jackson. And yeah, Hellstrike is a fun character in the the Tom Rainey Warren Ellis Stormwatch. Unfortunately, there was no way to do this, making him kind of you know, his own character. He's only talked about, right, in in, in this book. There was sort of no way to... I could... Maybe a better writer would have found a way, but I did not find a way, and I didn't have enough time. Um, so he kind of does recede to the background, but he's, he's a present force in, in this story, certainly for Jackson. Um, in some of the flashback scenes, to give something extra visual to talkie panels... You've got that mall like figure um, in issue two that Jackson is fighting, um, who shows up like Deathstroke is on the panel with him. Um, mm-hmm. That was not supposed to be Maul. That was supposed to be the, the Stormwatch 16 monster that kills Jackson as a way of doing a little bit of like, if you remember this thing that no healthy human being probably remembers. <laughs> Like then, then I'm kind of like winking at you that like this guy's probably not going to make it out of the miniseries. Jacob Marlowe, so much fun. Kaizen Gamora, so much fun. Cybernary was a was 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 in there, not just because like she was so perfectly situated to tell this generational story about American power and its client states um, from Kaizen to her um, and have that lineage. But also, like, Cybernary is an insanely complicated character who's also kind of present throughout various iterations of Wildstorm. So I wanted her to be there for this one. And then, of course, Bendix. So to back up for a second, there was a there was when I was when it when it came time for me to to write the script for issue four, I got a little stuck for a bit. I, I knew I had the, the scenes that I knew I had were um, the the fi- the cybernary battle against General Rong and the PLA and 
the Senate scene. But then I was like, what else? You know, there's not really going to be anything else that I have in mind that's going to be like really powerful and visual. Um, what should I do? Like, how do I, how do I make this a good comic book? Mm-hmm. And here I called on um, the the formidable talents of a very good friend of mine, Matt Bors, um, who was the Matt. the political cartoonist and editor of the Nib, um, for which he won an Eisner, for which he was twice a Pulitzer finalist, and as well um, an incredible comic book writer of uh an incredible series called justice warriors that you should buy in collection. they were on to talk on the they podcast weren't listening to a fabulous book li- so good listen so listen good. to the graphic policy interview with ben clarkson and matt Bors of justice warriors you will hear more announcements from matt in the coming months that should make you very excited but that's not mine to tell so i asked matt like what should i do here and he goes he thinks for a second and goes, well, the book is called Waller versus Wildstorm. Throw in a shitload of Wildstorm characters in issue four. So like, I was like, that's fucking perfect. Thank you. If I lean heavily into going up on Skywatch, then I get to have like the, the climactic scene that I hadn't figured out quite how to get to but with Bendix because we've been hinting at the weatherman and don't have them. That's when it occurred to me, well, if we have Bendix, who we've talked about but not shown then we also have to have Kaizen Gamora. And like, that's a fu- that like, that's a fun, mm-hmm. like thread to pull on if we're going to have Kaizen there. Cause like, what's his role is he, he works very well as a foil as a villain. Naturally he's classically suited for that, but also there's this farcical element of their camaraderie, given that they are nominally a, a, a raid against one another, but in the wild storm you, but in our story, we're showing the continuities rather than the departures there. And that meant also I could have like Angela Spica. I could have, Mm -hmm. if we're going into space, engineer, if we're going into space, how do we get into space? It was like, okay, let's have Amanda Waller in engineer coding. And so we can have Angie there. And then if we're going to be on Skywatch, we can have Molly Perkins there, who is a character that I think Warren Ellis creates or otherwise definitely in the, the Ellis rainy storm watch Molly is, is a, a kind of constant presence solving problems and expositing others. And is a really fun character. So I wanted her in there and how do we get into space? Let's have Mr. Majestic. And then if we have majestic, then we can kind of like do a little bit of a riff on the Caribbean Damonite war that existed the very first Wildstorm comic in, War- in Wildcats number one, but also play with Alan Moore's innovation that because this is so impossibly far away, the war has actually been over for hundreds, if not thousands of years before the events of Wildcats number one. And everyone who's yeah. still fighting this war on Earth doesn't realize that in fact their war is long since ended and there's no stakes here. That was really, I thought that was very interesting and deliberate commentary on. Yes. It was uh, just such an opportunity. It was a, it was a political (laughs) opportunity that like once unlocked, once the wild storm of it all for issue four was unlocked. Thanks to Matt. I, I realized in the writing, like you could really get a lot out of playing with. Yeah. Plato's ongoing cold war in space. Yes. Well said. Wow. Oh, thank you. And one last question was from Dimite. What, if any, do you consider to be the essential Wildstorm stories to read? I mean, we talked a little bit about what was in the most close tie into this in, in the our first interview around the series, but like, I think this gets to more like which Wildstorm books you feel like are just really great and like super Wildstormy. Yeah. Okay. So also, this lets me as. As, as is just like a window into my personality. After I answered that question and heard our interview, I immediately thought, I was like, oh no, I should have mentioned this, this, and this. So now I have those this, this, and this is in front of me. So don't forget. That. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Wildcats is a Wildcats has basically been everything in comics over the course of like the years. 1992, I guess, tw- 
the late 2000s, something like that, the changes in the various iterations of Wildcats are mind blowing in how like this was a Jim Lee superhero comic that very visually, I think it's fair to say without any disrespect to the legend, very visually echoed what he had just been doing with the X-Men. And Mm -hmm. it becomes, it just becomes something so radically different over the years, thanks to various creators. Uh, There is a trade paperback. If you can find this book, it's, it's, it's a collection of what Alan Moore did for Wildstorm. It's called Alan Moore Wild Worlds. Among the, 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 the things that's so great about this as it relates to Wildcats is it introduces that idea that like the Wildcats actually have no real rationale, that this is a war that ended long ago. And that basically, like, that was a, just a, an elegant and brilliant tweak to the concept that also kind of meant the concept didn't really have anywhere to go until it could be reinvented. And then these probably, I have old printings of these, so they're, 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 they're going to be hard to find, but they will reward you so much. The Wildcats 3.0 series that Joe Casey and Dustin Nguyen do, Richard Friend is also on that, is exquisite. It is hmm. superhero comics without superheroes, whereby the Wildcats transition into being influ- in instruments of corporate espionage as a tool to advance mankind. It is a disquisition on capitalism that you would not normally expect. It, it, all, it doesn't say everything that I would say, and, and it has a critique that is not mine and probably not yours as well, Alana's. But hmm. at the same time, like it's, it's so good. It, it is a real, it, it is, the presentation of an idea that had currency at a time where the left was pretty decimated because of the collapse after the Cold War and the seeming intellectual end, and definitely at that point, like end in terms of material power of socialism. And so Casey and Nguyen are kind of operating within that wreckage. That's a fantastic book. If you can find that, definitely get it. Um, we already talked about the last time around the Ellis Rainey Stormwatch, and those are fantastic, fantastic comics. Um, both volumes of that, I think you can still find that collected through DC Infinite. Um, but there are also really great Stormwatch runs that are kind of lesser remembered that kind of come. It, the Stormwatch stuff that comes after the authority, um, there's, there's kind of this, there's a bit of collective mismemory that Stormwatch leads into the authority, and then that's sort of it for Stormwatch. And that makes sense because of the overwhelming cultural influence in comics that the authority justly had. But after the authority, there are a bunch of efforts at revamping Stormwatch for a, mm-hmm. for a post-authority age. One of which is really, really good that Christos Gage and Doug Mackey did called Stormwatch Post Human Division. Jackson King is in charge. Um, yeah. Of, uh, I read that. Yeah. That's a really good one. There's another one called this is, and I, I thank Matt Bores for this because Matt literally got me these comics called Stormwatch Team Achilles. That's a very dark book that's very much like Stormwatch amidst the apocalypse. But also, at like unexpectedly, Wills Portasio draws a lot of that, and it's some of the last, like s- like sustained interiors you see from Wills for like a long time before and a long time since. Um, and there is also in the immediate aftermath of the transition from Stormwatch to the Authority, there's a book that's absolutely batshit called The Monarchy that features Jackson King. And um, that's by Docell Young, John McRae. Um, That's a wild, wild book. Weird stuff happens all throughout, but my version of Jackson King um, is like someone who, through seeming probity, 
you know, where he says, I'm here to document something in issue one to Lois Lane. By issue two, we learn that what he has come bearing documents to document is by no means the full truth about what's been mm-hmm. going on with Amanda Waller and Checkmate. And that ruthlessness comes from uh, the portrayal of Jackson in this book, The Monarchy, with, w- whose subheadline is Bullets Over Babylon. Good luck finding that. There, there, it's, it's an authority story as well as a Stormwatch story. Um, I think I have those crossover issues. It's super hard to find. I had to find, I found this in a room. This was a sheer, this was luck that I found this book. Like, oh, yeah. Um, anyway, those are some really, there's, so, there's a lot of great Wildstorm stuff. I really liked Matthew Rosenberg and Steven Segovia's just concluded 12 issue DC series that, that was a relaunch of Wildcats. I thought that was a really successful book. It added a level of humor that Wildcats often, really often did not have and found in both classic and characters to, to use throughout every iteration of Wildcats that we've just talked about being like so vastly divergent in what it presented. That was a great book too. Definitely when that gets collected, go pick that up also. Awesome. Yeah. Those are great recommendations. I mean, I'll just say for anybody who really hasn't like read the authority run, the original authority run, like that shit's great. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's justly transformative and inflection point in the history of superhero comics. It's fantastic. I just didn't want to say the same stuff I said on the last episode. Oh, I know. Yeah. I I know for sure. For sure. For anybody. The authority, planetary, sleeper. What, what am I forgetting? Team Seven, the t- the Jim Lee Tim Sale Death Blow is so good. Mm. We talked about it earlier on the podcast. That yeah, book is have to so good. It's a vampire story, weirdly, but like lightning in a bottle when you can get um, the nineteen ninety three four incarnations of Jim Lee and Team and Tim Sale on one book. Love it. Thank you for such a great opportunity to talk about this book at such length where I could be indulgent about like talking about the the choices made in this comic. I guess all I would would say outside of that is how grateful I am that this exists at all. How grateful mm-hmm. I am to my friend Evan Narciss for functionally teaching me how to write comics for in the years before we worked on this, showing me his scripts for amazing, amazing books like his Rise of the Black Panther. It's no coincidence that this is a year one book after Evan did one of, I think, the best year one books in comics. It, I'm so grateful to, to Eric Battle, to Jesus Marino, to our inker Vicente Sifuentes, to Mike Atia, to Dave Sharp, to Jorge Fornes, one of the best artist, most exciting artist in comics right now, whose covers just defined the look and feel of this book. I'm so grateful to Jim Lee, who I can't believe mm-hmm. I'm saying these words, had me on a panel at New York Comic Con and promoted this book. Marie Javins, the DC editor-in-chief. Jim and Marie believed in this book. They 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 made sure that it happened. Above all, to Marquise Draper and Chris Conroy, without whom this book would never have happened. Chris in particular for believing in me who had never written a comic book for just seeing my enthusiasm for, for doing this and, and being willing to take a chance. And the, on at least two occasions, this book could have collapsed and not ever seen the light of day and I would have acknowledged in both of those occasions that like, yep, that's show business. It happens and not have been mad about it. Disappointed, but not mad. And it is because of Chris that this book happened, that this book pulled victory from the jaws of defeat, pulled existence from the jaws of non-existence. I'm always going to be grateful to Chris Conroy for that. He is a visionary editor. He edits, if you can believe this, all of Black Label, 
all of the Sandman universe stuff, all of Milestone. You're going to hear great it's things. Crazy. I know you're yeah. going to hear, and so well, you're going to hear such great things from Chris, not just now, but in the future. I love to hear it. Oh shit. I had one thing that I wanted to jump in and pretend that we'd said earlier. Sure. We end the book with how Amanda ends up running the program in Belle Reve and that final panel of her, where you can see the silhouettes of some of the iconic yeah. uh, suicide squad characters behind her. One moment that really struck me was her recoiling when she sees it's a prison in Louisiana. And that felt like a particular piece of commentary around her being a black woman in this position and that kind of dual consciousness. Amanda Waller pulled off a Henry Kissinger level success. And we set up often in this book, in the first three issues, the expectation that she will reap a Henry Kissinger esque reward. We have Marlowe in issue three talking about how this is the kind of shit that gets you made weatherman. Amanda Waller, a black woman in this apparatus, was never going to be made Mm -hmm. Weatherman. She would have to, as she does in the DCU, dig that out for herself. Power is not going to treat Amanda Waller that way. It's going to put its hands on her shoulders and say, wouldn't you like to run a prison? Wouldn't Mm -hmm. you like to... Situated on one of Terrebonne Parish's grandest uh, estates. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is a plantation that is a jail. Uh, Amanda Waller knows exactly where she is being put after she has done an epical service for the United States of America. And that was always going to be the way this book ended. Because it's a year one for Amanda Waller, which means it has to end with her and Bell Rev. Which means that inside the machinery of the U.S. national security apparatus, for someone like her to even be put in charge of Task Force X, she would have had to pull off the most epic thing possible, the most epic thing conceivable, Mm -hmm. to have gotten even such a meager reward. And so now, by the time that we meet Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad, in the Legend series, obviously, before... Don't come for me, nerds. And then (laughs) the Ostrander Suicide Squad. Now we know that she has masterminded a supreme geopolitical triumph for which she will never get a due reward. And that that had to be trying to do it. That had to be like the 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 final like when I mentioned that we were getting to a point where like there had to be like three reversals and reveals in the span of five pages, like that was always going to be like the hammer blow of the last one. It seems two pages before that Amanda has won thoroughly by overthrowing Adelaide. But now we see what her reward actually is for winning. And that, that, that was always going to, that, that was always going to be, once I saw what this story was, that was always going to be how I, how I saw it ending. We say early on in issue two, Hey, she won. And then we, 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 we tell you in issue two, I, I remember texting Evan this as I was writing issue two. I was like, the way this scene is turning out with, with Waller and Adelaide, what if we just tell a reader right there that they won? And like, we'll reiterate that in three. But by the time we get to three, Adelaide and Amanda's uh, plot will have resulted in the death of Battalion. And Amanda will be looking like she has just walked over, like that she has done something so horrific that she's having trouble like keeping her bearings. And Adeline gives her a bearings back by saying, look at it this way, we won. And so now we go into four with the question of, after we get out of the Senate hearing, once again, we won. She won. Now it's time to get our reward. But it's in the reward that she loses. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the reward she wanted, and it feels even like it's a racialized reward. Exactly. It's definitely not the reward that remotely suits the scale of her achievement. We are, we're, we're pointing out that she was never going to get that reward. She, we have in the first scene, the first flashback scene, Amanda and Battalion together 
talking about going up on Skywatch. In the second issue flashback scene with Amanda and Battalion together, Amanda points out like a flip of the original language in that scene in terms of inflection, where she says, this is how one of us gets up on Skywatch. One of us. And it's meaning it's going to be me and not you. Mm -hmm. And now Amanda gets there. And this is how they treat her on Skywatch. Well, thank you again. This is exactly the conversation I want to be having. And this is like why we do this show is to talk about stuff like this. So folks should be buying their copy of Waller versus Wildstorm 4 and subscribing to your uh, newsletter, which is Forever Wars at Ghosts. Yes, Forever War, foreverwars.ghost.io. Big fan of ghost.io's Forever Wars. And uh, come hang out with us on the blue sky. Uh, I'm at L-E-V-I-N, and you have maintained your storied handle. Yes, I'm Tackerman. I'm a Tackerman <laughs> on Blue Sky. I'm also a Tackerman on Instagram. Uh, a T T A C K E R M A N. And uh, as we like to say on Graphic Policy, keep it geeky. Oh, and uh, guys, I know there have been weird ads at the end of episodes lately. We're trying to get to the bottom of where they're coming from. I did not put them there. Uh, I think it might have something that the platform we're using is adding. But know that I am not getting any money from them, and they are indeed obnoxious, and I'm trying to get that sorted out. So, uh, appreciate your forbearance. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.